Okay. Hi, mm -hmm. and everybody. Um, welcome. This is a, a Zoom live, which will also be posted um, in perpetuity uh, on, on YouTube. Um, my name is Tracy Morgan. I am I'm here today with Dr. Noelle Mc, Mc, McAfee, excuse me, McAfee, I, correct? McAfee. McAfee. You always get it right. I do. Okay. I just, except for that time. <laughs> I dinners I don't usually do live. Um, I mean, we do live, but we don't usually do actually with any visuals um, and new books in psychoanalysis. But so this is um, to the audience. This is a departure where you've um, decided to um, highlight um, Noel's book. Uh, if you're a breakdown, um, politics and psychoanalysis. We did an interview on new books and psychoanalysis and it was really like the most popular thing we'd ever seen. There were like 10,000 downloads and we thought, okay, there's a felt need. Um, and so we thought we've been toying with the idea of doing more live um, things. And uh, so we thought we would begin um, with you. So welcome back um, and thank you for embarking on the experiment with us. Um, My here. pleasure, thank you. Yeah, um, so uh, we have questions. Um, we've been sort of putting the word out on Instagram and Facebook and asking people um, if, if they wanted to contribute, um, if they had any questions. So I have a couple of questions up front. Um, I am hopeful, I am hopeful that others will sign on if they have questions. Um, they can post them, and if not, we'll just converse more. Um, obviously, a lot has changed since we last spoke in the world of politics. Uh, so it is, um, I think we spoke two months ago, perhaps. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And we are now in um, some, in some ways, uh, a, a different landscape with um, Black Lives Matter protests all over the nation and in the world. Um, so it, brings a whole, other, a whole other layer to what we can discuss today. Um, so um, I'm gonna begin with uh, the first uh, question, um, which uh, comes from um, Isaac DeVries, who is actually a host on New Books and Psychoanalysis. Um, and here's his question. Ready? Adam Smith listed deliberation as one of the bourgeois virtues of capitalism. Deliberation is also idealized in virtue or character ethics, which is an ethical framework adjacent and in league with ego psychology. In these days, in these times with rampant white supremacy, misogyny, patriarchy, these are all in caps, interestingly, and anti-black racism and anti-LGBTQ, why would we continue deliberating with people who perpetuate these positions when more and more it seems deliberation has failed and worse can function to keep these horrors in place? Instead, he asks, why not discern where the line is and insist on a full refusal of association uh, with people who perpetuate such views and politics? What might psychoanalysis be, he asked, if it were to take a position of refusal or to put it in the old register, resistance? So. Okay. Well, yeah. I think Isaac DeVries has been reading, uh, has read a good amount of deliberative theory enough to know that uh, what, what is uh, really problematic in a lot of it. It's true. It's true that. Um, it was the chattering class that had the money, was able to go to the coffee shops and the pubs and take part in deciding the matters of the day. And most people were too poor or too busy working to do that. So yes, it was. But it's also, I mean, it's not like the bourgeoisie invented deliberation, right? Think about it. whenever anyone has to decide what to do, if they have some long-term vision, they will pause and deliberate. We deliberate by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Am I going to um, send my kid to a private school or am I going to support this movement or am I going to, uh, whatever I'm going to do involves weighing the, the pros and cons of any course of action. Mm -hmm. So my view is very much an a, a affective psychoanalytic view that when we are deliberating, we're trying to decide between things that are valuable, what to do and what we're willing to pay, what we're willing to give up. 
to go in one direction or the other. So I, for 20 years of my writing in deliberative democratic theory, I've been pushing back against the kind of view that I think that Isaac is referring to. Yeah, I push back a lot there. But I don't, um, I think kind of refusing um, goes nowhere, right? So what, so in the book that I go through these different steps, um, I don't want to take too long with this question. It's a great question, but that's lots of different moments of politics, of democratic politics, the, the people's politics. One moment is identifying an issue or naming it, thematizing it. And the Black Lives Movement has, has been doing that for many years. And now it is getting a lot of uptake and there's coalitions that are building across in fact, coalitions with people that before somebody might say, I refuse to join forces with you. And now some of those folks are on the street next, side by side, arm in arm. So the refusing cuts off coalitions and you don't really know who you're going to have next. But once we put a matter on the agenda, then we need to decide what to do. And so deliberating is, a, is just a part of a process of deciding what to do. So yeah, that's my answer to that. Yeah, I think um, in some of the questions um, that uh, we received, there was, uh, I'm gonna pull some themes out. There was a question of deliberation and power uh, with different, um, different you know, groups having different access to social and political power when they come together to deliberate. Um, how, and I think this links up a little bit to the question I was asking you in the interview, like, well, how does the melancholic get to deliver, you know, how do people who um, have different, different access to power or the capacity to tolerate loss get to, get to participate politically in a deliberative, your deliberative model? Um, I don't think they're in, in the Habermas model, for instance, the Habermasian model. So there, was a, a lot of, there were a lot of questions around power. Yeah. So in my previous book, um, Democracy and the Political Unconscious, I talk about um, the public sphere as the space of our collective sublimations. And there are those who've been cut out of being able to participate. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the political unconscious of those who've been, been told that what you say does not matter and they're disenfranchised and disempowered from being able to participate. And that's been systematic. It's been going on for hundreds and thousands of years. Right. right. Throughout human history, human beings have done terrible things to each other, and some have been completely disenfranchised or made so that they're not really capable or they have a mindset that I can't, what I say doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So that is um, a powerful, you know, impediment. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. the, um, the way through it is for people to be able to take part in whatever way they can take part. So that, that it's, it's difficult doesn't mean that it's not important. But what, what do you think is the alternative, Tracy, in your question? I, I, I don't know, but I think that um, part of what um, people are getting at is like, like the, the end of Isaac's question, for instance, said, you know, that like, why not just refuse? In a way we see like you're in the academy, we see the trigger warnings are a refusal. Like there's a refusal to sort of stay in a feeling that I can't, talk to this person i can't be with this person by by being by being with them at some level uh i end up it, participating in my own erasure does that make sense i i hear this um from people that like because we come to the table in your book you talk about um in uh, an event in chicago where a uh, sort of you know white lady from westchester you know and um, a poor black woman um, receiving public assistance end up in, co in conversation. Um, but sometimes I'm wondering when we, when we deliberate and we have such imbalances of power, I, I don't, I mean, I don't have a, a clear, clear question, but I know that that came up a lot in listening to our interview. Okay. There's a, a wonderful essay by Iris Marion Young on activist challenges to deliberative democracy. And he gets at a lot of these things, right? What is the activist going to say to the person who's in their suit inside the deliberative hall? Um, and the, the, the person in their suit in the deliberative hall is kind of irritated by the activists on the street protesting. And it seems like, and for her, for Iris Young, it really does seem like that these are exclusive options. Mm -hmm. I see them as two moments in a larger decentered political process. Mm -hmm. we, if we're only going with deliberation, 
then the voices of the, the concerns of those who aren't in the room are left out. And there's a very narrow range of what can, what should be deliberated on what should be decided. Um, if we, uh, if we're only, if we're only protesting, then, and, and just making demands, then the community doesn't go through the work of deciding what to do and what to give up in order to make change happen. Mm -hmm. and deliberation doesn't just happen in deliberative halls. It happens on the streets as well. Like, during the Occupy movement, when people were demonstrating, but they were also deliberating amongst themselves about what to do. So the thing about, let's just take deliberation off as some kind of rational pedestal. It's simply the human task of deciding and thinking and weighing and being willing to give up to go this way rather than that. It's not some special philosophical or bourgeois practice only. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, um, Right, the word bourgeois. I think it comes up some in another one of the questions. You know, kind of like, well, you know, what what is this thing called deliberation, and who who gets who gets to do it? Um, I have something. I'll, I'll maybe you can loop back to that because I was thinking of a personal experience, and I would love to sort of get your thoughts. But let's let's move to another question. Um, and actually, uh, oh, somebody's here. We go. Um, this also comes. This comes from another host uh, from New Books and Psychoanalysis, and um, this is um, from Stephen Dozman. Um, and he said, "You know, I've I've listened to the episode. I've not read the book. Um, uh, I, I'm wondering if I'm going to paraphrase. It's long. I'm, if her approach to politics is overly idealist, it's one thing to emphasize hearing out alternative perspectives, but she seems to want to emphasize listening for its own sake." Question mark, rather than clarifying and formulating a more robust political agenda platform list of demands. There were a lot of feelings around demands, um, uh, came up around demands as well. Um, uh, she seems to discount various power, power differentials for, this is a back to the power question, for different opinion holders, the wealthy New Yorker, the Chicago welfare mom, and that our current system has interests that are inherently antagonistic and won't lend themselves to easy dispute. Um, since climate change was mentioned, think of an oil CEO hearing out eco-activists. Not only does the one CEO have way more power in deciding what gets done, but they have specific interests at stake in not being convinced. The result is uh, that perhaps she almost uh, seems to be avoiding politics at times, engaging in a solipsistic journey, uh, rather than reckoning with political power along with attempts to change it. To put it in language that came up in the interview itself, is this refusal to engage beyond just talking, her own way of refusing to mourn and grow up? Hard question, but. <laughs> yeah, let me, that you last. You arouse feelings. Yeah. Just I the last point. So I see deliberation as a work of mourning. So the larger frame of the kind of the logic of the, of the argument is that, it's, that we need to move from a paranoid schizoid politics of demands and just stamping our foot and we want what we want, damn it. Um, which is a vital, but that's not all, to a politics of a kind of declining and depressive position, working through mm -hmm. um, the melancholic clinging to the lost ideal thing and working towards, we might want to say, kind of Lacanian sub sublimation of trying to make do with what we have in the world, right? So the, the point is that deliberation is a kind of working through loss and what must be given up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a lot of the, the, sounds like a lot of the questioners are really focusing on a, a real phenomenon of vertical power. Some yes. have power over others, yes. right? Yes. Very much. But there is another power, uh, and they're not, again, these are not mutually, you know, different ways. They're, they work at the same time of a horizontal power. What happens when people come together, right? What happened when people came like, together? Like we're seeing now. Yeah, exactly. What, yeah. what happens is people, there's a kind of horizontal power that um, defies tanks. Now, sometimes the tanks will run over people, right? And the cops will, my son was, my son was shot by a rubber bullet at a demonstration a, a while back, a few months at the beginning. So, I mean, that, that's real, that's real power, but there's also a very real horizontal power. And um, Hannah Arendt, I, she's one of my favorites, has an essay on violence um, which has some problems that some of your listeners know about, but it has it makes a really great point that just pure force and coercion is empty. It is it's a sign of not having power. 
When the police have to sh throw shoot rubber bullets at people, that's a sign they have lost legitimacy and, and any real um, power. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to think about the power that people have. And too often in this kind of other way of thinking about it, they, uh, don't, they just don't even see their own power, mm -hmm. what they can do. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that that that's certainly what we're seeing now. Like, I mean, you know, you're in Atlanta, I'm in New York. I mean, there is a sense of, um, of you know, power in the streets and people like you know, laying out agendas and, you know, obviously born of, born of deliberation, but um, watching um, people take back their own power. I mean, in the book, you talk about, um, uh, you know, sort of in a way it's like because becoming, I think, is how you think of it as becoming a citizen, is that correct? I mean, that there's a sort of a, a, a different sort of subject position that one eventually comes to occupy. Um, but just because you are, you have the passport doesn't mean that one experiences oneself as, as a citizen. Um, that, to me, that's a very complicated, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a complicated psychological process as well. I mean, how do we keep people from thinking of themselves as citizens? And when people wake up and are feel themselves to be citizens, as we're seeing now, there, there's, a, a, of course, a shakeup. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so and it's a question as much as just a thought about becoming a citizen. And it's rich. So um, I, I'd say that in a way, I'd kind of definition of this kind of citizen is someone who feels like they can call a meeting in their neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. or right. To or go, call a demonstration. Oh, call, yeah, call, call it, let's yeah. just do something. And we've got five-year-olds, eight-year-olds who are calling for demonstrations. So they're, they have that sense of, I can do something. Now, the problem is our politics teaches people they have no voice. All you do is vote once every so-and-so, and that doesn't really do anything. So okay. the culture teaches people that what you say does not really matter. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty bold and radical move to say what I say matters, especially when people, you know, Black Lives Matter is a performative utterance in the face of a world that says, no, you don't matter. To say I do is effectively to, to, to act as a citizen, as someone who can make a statement about mm -hmm. what the world ought to be like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's very exciting. Um, when one realizes one goes from um, having walked around and not felt like a citizen to stepping across a certain threshold and feeling like like a citizen, um, there's you know I, when when that happened to me, I was probably in my late twenties and I was involved with ACT UP, and I knew that suddenly I could make change, and that I had I didn't have as much power as somebody in the boardroom, but I had the power that I had could be leveraged in ways that, that could be true, could be, and I would argue were transformative. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's almost like through the looking glass, you know, you're like, oh, now I'm in, now I can feel myself as a citizen. I mean, how many people have said to me, actually it's interesting, like in the past month, like, well, I just don't go to demonstrations. I just don't do that. I don't, and I think it's a discomfort about like occupying the citizen position. Like they're, they do that over there. And it's like, well, actually you get in, you can get in the mix and, and you can feel yourself, the citizen part of yourself arise, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you, if you feel like, oh, that's not for me. And there's an embarrassment. I wanted to, this is not, this just came up now, but thinking about some of my friends and colleagues who are, don't want to demonstrate, I can sense they're a little embarrassed because it's putting their desire out into the world and it's safer to sort of to, to some in some degree give up on it and stay home um something embarrassing about citizenry like there's something something sexual and and something something to it i don't yeah. know it um in a way it's a kind of joy to take part in something bigger than oneself Right. Again, you know, public happiness, the, the, the happiness of the revolution when people are involved in something, it's so exhilarating. Uh, right. Christopher Hedges writes about this too. War is a force that gives us meaning. Any kind of activity like this is exhilarating. 
there's a lot of different ways to do it. There's not just demonstrating. It could be, you know, an art project or some something else that could that could tap people. Um, but there also, I think, in the background of this is a kind of invisibility in our culture of the, the horizontal power that people have. Right. I mentioned in the book uh, the story when my family got this prize-winning African hound, uh, mm -hmm. and the person who brought it to us to we're going to be fostering the dog said. Um, this dog could jump your eight your foot fence, but don't worry because she doesn't know she can. Right. And I thought, oh, that's so sad. Right. And I've always felt like, I mean, that kind of sadness when people are completely unaware of the power that they have, mm -hmm. that, that can happen when people make a plan and get together. That's when that kind of power happens. Mm -hmm. But so, some systems will just tell you that you don't have it or just scare the, the Jesus out of you. My, my mother's Greek and I was in Greece after the um, colonels, you know, what were had been booted out of power, but still people were terrified to speak about politics at all. Mm -hmm. So for, it took years for that kind of ability to take to be political for that to come back. Right, right, right. That the the discomfort and the fear, you know, the fear that under a circumstance like that. I'm also just remembering a, like a whatever a month ago. So there's been a lot of stuff going on in New York around the city council and the, and the budget and people have been sleeping outside of, you know, city hall and pushing um, Mayor de Blasio um, to cut, right, in the real way, cut the police um, budget. And initially there was this email that went around to lots of people just saying, call your local city council person and just say, you know, you know do not vote tomorrow. Instead, ask for a hearing. We want to have a hearing because we want to open it up for deliberation. And I, I, you know, it was fascinating. Some friends said to me, oh, I I've never, would never make that phone call. I mean, I, to my city council person. I mean, I was like, the, the, from the privacy of one's own home or an email. And that was, that was kind of, you know, that was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. was like what? And these are people, you know, uh, you know, whatever, white people with PhDs, you know, and that the feeling is, oh, I can't do it. I don't do that sort of thing. What, what, what does one, how does it change one to do that sort of thing? You know, I'm wondering what is the sort of the, uh, it's as if it would change who you are. And I guess it would, you know, to some degree. Yes, definitely, definitely. I, um, I wrote this piece for the Los Angeles Review of Books last summer where I talk about when I was in college, I was running the pre-law association, but I was not a political person at all. And I was doing the LSAT prep course and I brought together the people who'd be our instructors. And these two guys, one is a young professor and the other is a graduate student, started talking about politics together back and forth, what the president did, what they thought. And I'm just dumbfounded because they're talking as if what they say matters. And it never occurred to me to talk about politics. What would be the point? I mean, I mean, just talking about politics, I could not see myself doing that. But I was fascinated by their sense of having a voice. Yeah. I think it's a very foreign notion and it could be frightening, right? Yeah, because it's, it's like, it's actually, you know, to come out from hiding in a way to sort of, and, and to actually say like, I think what I think matters is like to risk being laughed at. Mm -hmm. So you know? more of the hard questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, here is, this is, a, this is a long, this is one of these questions that, um, has a preamble, like a larger preamble than what we've had. Um, and this comes, um, this question comes from Gail Newman, um, Dr. Gail Newman, uh, and she writes, um, let's see, um, Noelle's interest in, in Winnicott's fear of breakdown stems, as she describes in the NBIP podcast, from the quote, right-wing populist slogan, make America great again which reminds her of the, quote, self-holding defense against, quote, primitive agony. She describes the slogan as a delusion that these groups have developed to ward off a disaster that is imagined to be coming in the future, but which following Winnicott actually took place in the past. This is a fascinating issue and very relevant to the question of how politics, in her wonderful definition, can take place in the context of the current moment. But if we turn our attention to another, and in fact, the core aspect of Winnicott's essay, another set of political questions emerges. In Fear of Breakdown, as indeed in most of his papers, Winnicott returns again and again to the earliest stage in the development of the self 
or the ego, where without quote, good enough environmental provision, going on being is under constant threat. It is this threat of disintegration, depersonalization and unreality. Those are all Winnicott's, um, fr his phrasing from primitive emotional development that returns as a fear of breakdown. For Winnicott, the defense of self-holding provides a necessary illusion for those whose not good enough environmental provision made them susceptible to these constant threats. Here, the fear of breakdown points to breakdown that actually occurred, however much its occurrence has been compensated for by a false self whose entire job is to quote, hide the potential true self, which it does by compliance with environmental demands. But if the necessary auxiliary ego is completely absent, or worse, tantalizingly sporadically present, only to disappear randomly. The true self can never emerge and the individual then develops as an extension of the shell rather than of the core and as an extension of the impinging environment. That's also Winnicott from his uh, essay on aggression. On aggression. Um, so in this context, I'd like to ask how, how political engagement, which in uh, Noel McAfee's definition must involve a quote mature ability to embrace ambivalence and difference might not might need to be changed to accommodate those groups in our society whose facilitating environment was totally non-existent or dangerously tantalizing um, there's a few more sentences just so you know Noel, just to pace yourself and whose entire trajectories have been marked by impingement around which they were forced to shape their false identities in this case, the possibilities in the face of the impossibility of going on being are either existing in a split state of deeply hidden true self and constantly morphing false self or annihilation. In fact, for members of these groups, black people, trans people, for example, literal physical annihilation can in our society easily be forthcoming, even when their personality has become completely harmed by Thank you. Okay, has become completely compliant. As we have witnessed over and over again, the absolute quality of the political discourse that emerges from these marginalized, even foreclosed members of society represents, I believe, a challenge to the prevailing political discourse to contemplate how the reality of primal trauma, which precludes the development of subjecthood in the conventional sense, can play a role in its operations. I don't know if I can. That's I a can... big question. It's, it's big. It's really lovely. Thank you to Gail Newman for that um, yeah. question. Yeah. The, the, the preamble, I, I agree, was a, was a really good statement of the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so, is the so there's a, bit, a lot of it. Let me just clear. Is it about those who have suffered in early infancy? Mm -hmm. I think you know, she's, she's yeah. lack of right and no, which is a what poor is, facilitating environment. Yeah, that's what I take the essay to be about, that some of our psychotic patients are the ones who had a fear, had, had a breakdown, there was a breakdown. The, the right. caregiver was absent, depressed, not there. So they, they, they didn't have that kind of uh, um, auxiliary ego, as Gail says, the, um, the facilitating environment to create this kind of um, omnipotent self who, who, I was just reading a, a wonderful passage in another essay when I went across today about how, um, the infant, you know, makes the breast appear, but it's only because the mother actually brought it to there that mm -hmm. it could conjure it up. But this kind of facilitating environment gives this omnipotent uh, child the sense of, I can make things happen, to go back in a way to our previous discussion. I can make something happen. I can make the breast appear. It's all an omnipotent fantasy that's, you know, gradually d diluted. Um, but without that capacity to think I can make this happen, um, that they are uh, not a kind of real, a self, as he talks about a true self, a self who can perceive the world and trust their own intuitions and make something happen. Yeah. That is hard. So I, I haven't worked through this enough, but my intuition is that our political process, whether it's taking part in, you know, going down to the you know the civic center or whatever to um, to take part in the others is a kind of short circuit psychoanalytic so short circuit to healing and to mm -hmm. developing a capacity right so maybe someone who's been who suffered a lot as an infant um, as an adult can find opportunities to be able to create something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, right I don't think it answers it very well but. 
Well, it's, it's sort of, we can sort of go back to, which we spoke about in the interview a little bit. And I don't think that I was refined my question well enough. It was just sort of like appeared to me. It was not a prepared question. One of those things I was like, oh, um, but I keep thinking about the use of an object. And, you know, that, that, that we read that essay as about, you know, um, the baby destroying, right? The object that survives, but we, but I was more trying to say something about like, you know, like, like, what is it like we politically, what is it we need to survive? Okay, I was thinking the other day first, like, for instance, like white supremacy, right, we have all these books and white fragility, etc. That like white supremacy is not actually a strong enough object to survive destruction and makes it useless. And it's maddening. It's maddening that. Like it's, it, it's like, like what we want for people who are in a more melancholic position or aren't, aren't, don't have the citizen feeling, right? Which we could also say is, um, you know, a, a sign of um, a certain kind of development um, emotionally that, that would, we, I, I find that we get stuck, like we don't have and then a, 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 for instance, a government right now that is strong enough to survive are destroying it. It just goes elsewhere. It kind of makes us a little bit, a little bit crazy. So I'm thinking about how we bring people in and, peop and people get involved and come to develop that citizen feeling. They need an object that survives destruction in order to get to that feeling. I mean. Okay. I, I was confused before. I'm still confused, but so let me try to restate. Okay. I, what comes to mind is, in fact, um, the emperor has no clothes. Donald Trump is not the all-powerful villain who's going to survive everything. Right. He will fall apart. He will. He can be destroyed. His power yeah. can be destroyed. And and so there, when people realize, oh, he's not forever and ever. He's. I, I most people I know think that Trump is probably going to win again. It. There's no basis in reality that he's going to win again. <laughs> but we are all so traumatized. The disaster has already <laughs> happened. <laughs> is that what you're getting at, Tracy? I'm, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I just, I know that in order to participate in the world, to feel that one has a voice and can speak and has something to say, one, I do believe that having that early experience of an object that survived destruction is, is imperative. And I've been I'm thinking about, you know, the process of feeling oneself as a citizen that you talk about and being crossing over into sort of um, this more deliberative, um, the capacity to, to deliberate demands an experience of having an object survive uh, your destruction. And I'm just, just thinking at like as a, as a culture, as a society, um, you know, it, it, it's, we, there's no answer to it, you know, per se, but it's just something that Trying to, we could take it back to Gail's question that yeah. uh, if that that primary caregiver is not there and there there's no, there's nobody there that we can destroy because they're not even available precisely for me to scream I hate you mom right and still standing there I'm gonna right. kill you and they're still there right, but, right. I mean, that's the use of an object when the object is still there when you've tried to make it go away it's mm -hmm. still there that 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 is that kind of facilitating environment that allows you to come into full being right as right. a something like a true self. True self. So right. I think the questions dovetail right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you say more dovetail and? Well, um, that we need a facilitating environment that the facilitating environment makes possible to destroy an object and, and know that it's still there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I can't try to, you know, I hate you mother. Right. It's still there. Right. So then, oh, she's a real object and I'm a real self. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And deliberation seems to me potentially to really go awry when, when there are people in the room that have not had that experience. And so then we go back to the question of demands, um, you know, and you know, who, who, you know, when, when the object has not survived destruction, I'm wondering about you know, the, the making of, I think in the interview, there's like a, you talk about a stamping of feet and I, if I don't get it my way, I'm, I'm leaving 
I'm leaving the room. I mean, it's a moment, it's a moment of defeat um, for anyone who uh, finds themselves uh, in the my way or the highway uh, position, so. So this makes me think about the kinds of deliberations that I've observed of in, in grassroots communities, people coming together from mm -hmm. regular folks who are not elected, they're not wearing a tie, just coming together. And there was one where uh, there was somebody who was talking about, this was a long time ago, talking about, well, it's great that we've got Walmarts now, I can buy shirts for cheap. And this other person says, my community in North Carolina was just decimated when the textile mills all went overseas. We've mm -hmm. got nothing left. Mm -hmm. And so the first person saying, it just took him aback. He didn't realize that. I mean, there's human experience underlying these things. So if they all marched in with demands, bring the text out, or the, then it doesn't really go anywhere. Mm -hmm. I think to, to try to understand what what is at issue, what um, what is what is what am, what is the loss here? Mm -hmm. Well, demands though can come from deliberation. Right. I mean, groups like, for instance, groups have been deliberating throughout you know, New York City about like, you know, what what people want to see happen, for instance, with the city budget, where mm -hmm. do you where do you want the money to go? Now, the, you know, City Hall was deluged with a very clear set. I mean, all the city council people were met with a very clear set of demands. There is not a sense of deliberating with them. Um, Right. I mean, that that I'm wondering, like, I'm wondering about that. Like, so how far um, do we continue to deliberate with the city council members? Is that where do we well, an another way to go is to call for participatory budgeting. So Michael Menzer at Brooklyn College has been working with different city agencies and this for a right. long time in New York. So think about um, if the people say uh, they can demand, say, hey, why? How about we have a, a, a role in deciding how the budget is going to Play, get played out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so then the people have an opportunity to take part in that process and make the difficult choices. So you might go with, I'd really like X, Y, and Z, but then get in the room and go, well, how are we going to pay for this? What do we not pay for to get more of this? Mm -hmm. um, how are we going to take care of um, each other, our safety, whatever? But so it means beginning with what I want, let's just call demands what I want, what I'd really like to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And then the next step is, okay, how do we make that happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I tend to think of demands though as more, uh, is, as it's, so, it's interesting. Um, I've tended to think as sort of a, more of a street activist of, as demands as based in need. And, you know, in psychoanalysis, you know, at some level like needs are not really, are the, the things that can't, are not negotiable, wants. Are negotiable. Um, at least that's one one way I think of conceiving of it. You know that that what is a what is a need is it's it's it can't be negotiated. So demands. What's the relationship between demands, wants, and needs? Because you, you do you know you're you're suggesting that we enter into a a, a mourning a, a state of mourning. We have to give certain things up. But you know like what we're talking about like around the country now around you know, like we're talking about lives, right? We're talking about, you know, if certain needs are not met. I, I don't want to go with needs and wants. I, I think that's stuff like drives and, and, I mean, let's just, that there's things that are important to people that they really want, right? So I'm thinking of, I think it was either Seattle or um, maybe it was Minneapolis, but one of the communities that took back the community from the police, there was a really interesting New York Times piece about how there are activists who've been working for years, mostly black women who've been working for years mm -hmm. to create alternative ways for, to meet um, the community's needs and to take care of each other. Um, and then they joined this coalition now broadens. Now there are some like white young radicals, lefties who are joining in too. And they have an, other ideas too about what would be good for this community. So mm -hmm. there's some tension between in the coalition between one set of demands and another set of demands or what we are aspir our aspirations are. So as we build coalitions, even among those people who are in coalition, there's going to be some negotiating of what is it we're asking for? What is it we want? So it's not just us versus them, mm -hmm. but it's also even within us. I just reread uh, Claude, I mean, sorry, Ernesto Leclaus on populist reason, and he mm -hmm. uses the language of demands. But even he is seeing that in a, a real coalition that's 
plural and heterogeneous, there's going to be a need to, um, these are kind of empty signifiers about right. Um, right. what Black Lives Matter, what does that mean? How does that, how does that work? That's an empty signifier. That's great. So the people who can come in can have a different understanding of what that means. So that's a kind of process of, it's a discursive, if you want to use that term, a discursive process of trying to understand and create a new meaning mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for these terms. Right. And it certainly takes um, a lot of maturity to be able to, with, to withstand it. I mean, because you see like in many you know, political you know, organizations, um, the breakdown within the organization itself. And I'm sure you've witnessed this on, you know, like live, you know, like being involved in, in creating change where, you know, where there comes a split and people are unable to, um, you know, uh, well, of course, <laughs> psychoanalysis is, is a perfect example of uh, being <laughs> as, a, as a profession, but it's different than political organizing in terms of splitting. Um, but, you know, watching groups, um, uh, that um, like major socialist organizations in this country that people, you know, there's the trots inside and there's the Leninists and the group ends up like n people can't come, they don't come to terms, you know, it's and hard it's hard work. Yeah. It doesn't mean we don't have to be mature before we enter in. People can be <laughs> all kinds of levels, but it's hard work and it means treating other people with some respect mm -hmm. uh, and what, you know, especially if, when, if we're in coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of clinging, but here's the problem of demands. And I know that I'm the only person who's, <laughs> I don't really have any allies in this, but um, demands is sort of this kind of clinging. Wait, this, are you an outsider on this demand position yeah. like within your field? You are, yeah. okay. okay. Um, clinging to uh, an ideal, it's an idealized notion of this is what will be perfect. This is what will save us. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't allow for kind of metabolizing and taking in and dealing with conflict. And boy, I was accused before by Isaac of being a kind of ego psychologist, which I am not. So that's not <laughs> ego psychological, you know, trying to deal with um, conflict. It's about trying to open up and, and really rethink the meaning of our lives, which is what psychoanalysis is about too. Mm -hmm. What's the meaning of our lives and who are we? What is this community? Atlanta. It's a powerful place. And people have been wondering, you know, what is um, the, you know, one phrase, the, the city too busy to hate. There was lots of hate going on, but the kind of self-understanding of who we are that's constantly being transformed and demands just sort of blocks that process. It says, this is it and only this, instead of where, where are we going? What, working together to try to figure out what we want. Right. Instead of beginning with what I demand. Right. <laughs> you have a demand around demands, okay. <laughs> it's um, in, in, in a sense. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, a couple of more. Um, what do we have here? Um, oh, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Ah, okay. This is a melange of a question um, taken. Sometimes I just took different people's partial questions. Um, but people were, some people were interested in. Um, I asked you a question about mourning uh, last time about applied psychoanalysis and the turn to mourning. Um, uh, so let's see. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, the, okay. So applying mourning, the concept of mourning to politics, um, and uh, the use of the concept of mourning in applied psychoanalysis as as is, has been put forth by many academics of late. I think I brought this up in the interview as a kind of panacea for what ails the world. But you know, somebody said to me, well, when we mourn, we turn away from the world. So I'm, I guess the a couple of people picked up on that, they're like, but mourning is a turn, a, a turn away. One comes out the other side of mourning and turns toward the world and there's, there's you know, there, there's sort of two sides. And it's sort of a, a question about the use, several people want to know about the use of mourning in, in politics, if at some level mourning is the antithesis of engagement with the, with the external, um, that there's sort of a, a, a contradiction in the middle of that, perhaps. Um, I also, uh, I went back, I personally, I just went back and looked at Douglas Crimp's um, I don't know if you know that essay, Mourning and Militancy. 
um, in which he wrote, I think it was published, it was published in October, um, the journal out of MIT, probably in the late 1980s, um, in which he writes about AIDS activism and the um, mourning, going to funerals every night, going and watch, watching friends die, and the militancy that the group had to draw from and not collapse into mourning in order to create change. I mean, the way that ACT UP worked was, you know, that in the face of extraordinary terror, that people were gonna die and loss of whole, whole communities of, you know, men um, who had, you know, of lovers, of partners, of people still were able to get themselves out to the street. Now, Crimp asked the question, He's like, so to maintain this militancy, whither goest our mourning? Were we to stop to mourn, where would, where would we be? So I, I want, just wanted to throw that out there to think about if mourning is a turn away from the world, how does it work? Well, when you mourn the death of somebody that you love, that mourning, there's a long, it takes a long time to, to move beyond turning, wait, but you turn away from the world for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. um, in that deliberation I mentioned where the guy says, you know, I, I like to shop at Walmart for my cheap shirts. And then he hears from somebody, a human being in the room who says, uh, my community just lost everything because of for you to be able to do that. I'm gonna guess that that person, who, the first one who spoke went through a moment of mourning, like oh, mm -hmm. I thought this was the best thing in the world. And there's a real cost to this. Mm -hmm. And that would be a moment of, oh, a loss, right? Yeah. Um, did I tell you about my everyday morning thing when we talked before, right? Yeah. You know, like, you I, know, I, don't know, I don't know if it's on the interview. I think maybe when we spoke on the phone. Um, okay. But you yeah, write so, it, you read about it in the book. It's great. Right. So, I mean, everyday morning. When I, when I was writing the book, my, my, um, I had to go pick up a, my, I was sitting at my desk, happily writing, totally into it, one of those flow moments, and my timer goes off that it's time to go pick up a kid from school. And so I was like, oh. that was my turning away from the world. It's like, oh. now I could have gone into the melancholic, like, damn it. How come I'm the one who's always doing this and I'm just gonna hang on to my anger, go get her, but, but be angry. Or it could be, oh. okay. So I kind of gather myself up. So that's a, a moment of turning away. So I, I think in politics, we don't have that kind of cataclysmic when you, you know, a fellow activist has died but that kind of mourning that does call for a sitting with the pain. That's mm -hmm. what mourning is. It's sitting with the pain and the loss mm -hmm. and then gathering up the ability to cathect again with the world, right? So, so it's like a micro mourning. Yeah, everyday mourning. I mean, those of us who are not bitter and resentful go through our everyday mourning. When something happens like, <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. Then the, if we're in our worst days, we're just going to be bitter and resentful. We don't mourn. We just hang on to, damn it, I wanted that. And um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So mourning with not mourning with a capital M, but mourning with a small M. I mean, I I understand what you're saying. Um, there just were some questions about that, but pretty much, I'm I'm out of questions at the moment. Um, I don't have, um, let me see if there's any other sort of notes from people. Um, anything else that seemed um, practice of deciding? Clean humanity, blah, blah, blah. No, not a fair differentiation. Um, I think that for now, unless Can there's I say one thing to close, right? Of course, absolutely. Yeah, so the part of what I'm doing the book in between talking about the psychoanalytic are these democratic practices and not everybody has to do everything, but there's the, what we talked about thinking of oneself as a citizen, someone who can call a meeting or call for a demonstration. Um, there is seeing the world as one in which I can make a difference, having a, a different kind of imaginary of what the world is. There is the demonstrating kind of putting items on the agenda. Then there's processes of trying to decide what to do and then to about taking that public will and trying to create change and create new pathways in my community and all of these. These take place all the time. I'm not just calling for this. I'm noting they happen all the time. Mm -hmm. We're not aware of it. It's because it, it's so 
much a part of our kind of culture. What the Tocqueville also notice about human Americans that they actually tend to kind of roll up their sleeves and do something about problems. Mm -hmm. So, and in, you know, when I was in Greece during the seventies and saw the absence of that, yeah. that is um, striking. So in a way it's hard for us to see these things I'm talking about happen all the time. Mm -hmm. Otherwise we'd be living in a very desolate place and Donald Trump would win again, <laughs> but he won't. I'm putting it out there right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a demand. It's just a statement of fact. <laughs> <laughs> Just a statement of fact. Um, okay, so uh, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to have you and to speak more and um, and for being the first person in uh, our experimental, um, you know, going out into the world on YouTube. Um, just to say again, um, that um, Noelle's book, uh, just you can see here, Fear Breakdown, um, it's a uh, Gosh, I mean, it's Columbia. It's Columbia. My eyes are bad. Yeah, Columbia <laughs> University Press, and um, Noel is also a professor uh, at Emory. If, at, if uh, we did not mention that up top, sorry about that. But um, she's a professor at Emory, and um, I'm sure she's on to her next project. And um, we look forward to, to speaking again. Yes. So. Thank you, Tracy. Thank okay. you. All. all right. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.